everyone desires to live as long as he can everyone values health above all gold and treasure everyone knows that as far as his own individual good is concerned protracted life and a frame of body sound and strong free from the thousand pains that flesh is heir to are unspeakably more important than all other objects because life and health must be secured before any possible result of any possible circumstance can be of consequence to him in the improvement of the art which has for its object the preservation of health and life every individual is therefore deeply interested an enlightened physician and a skilful surgeon are in the daily habit of administering to their fellow-men more real and unquestionable good than is communicated or communicable by any other class of human beings to another ignorant physicians and surgeons are the most deadly enemies of the community the plague itself is not so destructive its ravages are at distant intervals and are accompanied with open and alarming notice of its purpose and power theirs are constant silent secret and it is while they are looked up to as saviors with the confidence of hope that they give speed to the progress of disease and certainty to the stroke of death it is deeply to be lamented that the community in general are so entirely ignorant of all that relates to the art and the science of medicine an explanation of the functions of the animal economy of their most common and important deviations from the healthy state of the remedies best adapted to restore them to a sound condition and of the mode in which they operate as far as that is known ought to form a part of every course of liberal education the profound ignorance of the people on all these subjects is attended with many disadvantages to themselves and operates unfavorably on the medical character in consequence of this want of information persons neither know what are the attainments of the man in whose hands they place their life nor what they ought to be they can neither form an opinion of the course of education which it is incumbent on him to follow nor judge of the success with which he has availed himself of the means of knowledge which have been afforded him there is one branch of medical education in particular the foundation in fact on which the whole superstructure must be raised the necessity of which is not commonly understood but which requires only to be stated to be perceived perhaps it is impossible to name any one subject which it is of more importance that the community should understand it is one in which every man's life is deeply implicated it is one on which every man's ignorance or information will have a considerable influence we shall therefore enter into it with some detail we shall show the kind of knowledge which it is indispensable that the physician and surgeon should possess we shall illustrate by a reference to particular cases the reason why this kind of knowledge cannot be dispensed with and we shall explain by a statement of facts the nature and extent of the obstacles which at present oppose the acquisition of this knowledge we repeat there is no subject in which every reader can be so immediately and deeply interested and we trust that he will give us his calm and unprejudiced attention the basis of all medical and surgical knowledge is anatomy not a single step can be made either in medicine or surgery considered either as an art or a science without it this should seem self-evident and to need neither proof nor illustration nevertheless as it is useful occasionally to contemplate the evidence of important truth we shall show why it is that there can be no rational medicine and no safe surgery without a thorough knowledge of anatomy disease which it is the object of these arts to prevent and to cure is denoted by disordered function disordered function cannot be understood without a knowledge of healthy function healthy function cannot be understood without a knowledge of structure structure cannot be understood unless it be examined the organs on which all the important functions of the human body depend are concealed from the view there is no possibility of ascertaining their situation and connections much less their nature and operation without inspecting the interior of this curious and complicated machine the results of the mechanism are visible the mechanism itself is concealed and must be investigated to be perceived 
the important operations of nature are seldom entirely hidden from the human eye still less are they obtruded upon it but over the most curious and wonderful operations of the animal economy so thick a veil is drawn that they could never have been perceived without the most patient and minute research the circulation of the blood for example never could have been discovered without dissection notwithstanding the partial knowledge of anatomy which must have been acquired by the accidents to which the human body is exposed by attention to wounded men by the observance of bodies killed by violence by the huntsman in using his prey by the priest in immolating his victims by the augur in pursuing his divinations by the slaughter of animals by the dissection of brutes and even occasionally by the dissection of the human body centuries after century passed away without a suspicion having been excited of the real functions of the two great systems of vessels arteries and veins it was not until the beginning of the seventeenth century when anatomy was ardently cultivated and had made considerable progress that the valves of the veins and of the heart were discovered and subsequently that the great harvey the pupil of the anatomist who discovered the latter by inspecting the structure of these valves by contemplating their disposition by reasoning upon their use was led to suspect the course of the blood and afterwards to demonstrate it several systems of vessels in which the most important functions of animal life are carried on the absorbent system for example and even that portion of it which receives the food after it is digested and which conveys it into the blood are invisible to the naked eye except under peculiar circumstances whence it must be evident not only that the interior of the human body must be laid open in order that its organs may be seen but that these organs must be minutely and patiently dissected in order that their structure may be understood the most important diseases have their seat in the organs of the body an accurate acquaintance with their situation is therefore absolutely necessary in order to ascertain the seats of disease but for the reasons already assigned their situation cannot be learnt without the study of anatomy in several regions organs the most different in structure and function are placed close to each other in what is termed the epigastric region for example are situated the stomach the liver the gallbladder the first portion of the small intestine the duodenum and a portion of the large intestine the colon each of these organs is essentially different in structure and in use and is liable to distinct diseases diseases the most diversified therefore requiring the most opposite treatment may exist in the same region of the body the discrimination of which is absolutely impossible without that knowledge which the study of anatomy alone can impart the seat of pain is often at a great distance from that of the affected organ in disease of the liver the pain is generally felt at the top of the right shoulder the right phrenic nerve sends a branch to the liver the third cervical nerve from which the phrenic arises distributes numerous branches to the neighborhood of the shoulder thus is established a nervous communication between the shoulder and the liver this is a fact which nothing but anatomy could teach and affords the explanation of a symptom which nothing but anatomy could give the knowledge of it would infallibly correct a mistake into which a person who is ignorant of it would be sure to fall in fact persons ignorant of it do constantly commit the error we have known several instances in which organic disease of the liver has been considered and treated as rheumatism of the shoulder in each of these cases disease in a most important organ might have been allowed to steal on insidiously until it became incurable while a person acquainted with anatomy would have detected it at once and cured it without difficulty many cases have occurred of persons who have been supposed to labor under disease of the liver and who have been treated accordingly on examination after death the liver has been found perfectly healthy but there has been discovered extensive disease of the brain disease of the liver is often mistaken for disease of the lungs 
On the other hand, the lungs have been found full of ulcers when they were supposed to have been perfectly sound, and when every symptom was referred to disease of the liver. Persons are constantly attacked with convulsions, children especially. Convulsions are spasms. Spasms, of course, are to be treated by antispasmodics. This is the notion amongst people ignorant of medicine. It is the notion amongst old medical men. It is the notion amongst half-educated young ones. All this time, these convulsions are merely a symptom. That symptom depends upon and denotes most important disease in the brain. The only chance of saving life is the prompt and vigorous application of proper remedies to the brain. But the practitioner, whose mind is occupied with the symptom, and who prescribes antispasmodics, not only loses the time in which alone anything can be done to snatch the victim from death, but by his remedies absolutely adds fuel to the flame which is consuming his patient. In disease of the hip joint, Pain is felt not in the hip, but in the early stage of the disease at the knee. This also depends on nervous communication. The most dreadful consequences daily occur from an ignorance of this single fact. In all these cases, error is inevitable without a knowledge of anatomy. It is scarcely possible with it. In all these cases, error is fatal. In all these cases, anatomy alone can prevent the error anatomy alone can correct it. Experience, so far from leading to its detection, would only establish it in men's minds and render its removal impossible. What is called experience is of no manner of use to an ignorant and unreflecting practitioner. In nothing does the adage that it is the wise only who profit by experience receive so complete an illustration as in medicine. A man who is ignorant of certain principles, and who is incapable of reasoning in a certain manner, may have daily before him for fifty years cases affording the most complete evidence of their truth and of the importance of the deduction to which they lead, without observing the one or deducing the other. Hence, the most profoundly ignorant of medicine are often the oldest members of the profession, and those who have had the most extensive practice. A medical education founded on a knowledge of anatomy is therefore not only indispensable to prevent the most fatal errors, but to enable a person to obtain advantage from those sources of improvement which extensive practice may open to him. To the surgeon, anatomy is eminently what Bacon has so beautifully said that knowledge in general is. It is power. It is power to lessen pain to save life, and to eradicate diseases, which without its aid would be incurable and fatal. It is impossible to convey to the reader a clear conception of this truth without a reference to particular cases, and the subject is one of such extreme importance that it may be worth while to direct the attention for a moment to two or three of the capital diseases which the surgeon is daily called upon to treat aneurysm for example is a disease of an artery and consists of a preternatural dilatation of its coats this dilatation arises from the debility of the vessel whence unable to resist the impetus of the blood it yields and is dilated into a sac when once the disease is induced it commonly goes on to increase with a steady and uninterrupted progress until at last it suddenly bursts and the patient expires instantaneously from loss of blood when left to itself it almost uniformly proves fatal in this manner yet before the time of galen no notice was taken of this terrible malady the ancients indeed who believed that the arteries were air tubes could not possibly have conceived the existence of an aneurysm were the number of individuals in europe who are now annually cured of aneurysm by the interference of art to be assumed as the basis of a calculation of the number of persons who must have perished by this disease from the beginning of the world to the time of galen it would convey some conception of the extent to which anatomical knowledge is the means of saving human life the only way in which it is possible to cure this disease is to produce an obliteration of the cavity of the artery 
This is the object of the operation. The diseased artery is exposed and a ligature is passed around it above the dilatation by means of which the blood is prevented from flowing into the sac and inflammation is excited in the vessel in consequence of which its sides adhere together and its cavity becomes obliterated the success of the operation depends entirely on the completeness of the adhesion of the sides of the vessel and the consequent obliteration of its cavity this adhesion will not take place unless the portion of the artery to which the ligature is applied be in a sound state if it be diseased as it almost always is near the seat of the aneurysm when the process of nature is completed by which the ligature is removed hemorrhage takes place and the patient dies just as if the aneurysm had been left to itself for a long time the ligature was applied as close as possible to the seat of the aneurysm the aneurysmal sac was laid open in its whole extent and the blood it contained was scooped out the consequence was that a large deep-seated sore composed of parts in an unhealthy state was formed it was necessary to the cure that this sore should superate granulate and heal a process which the constitution was frequently unable to support moreover there was a constant danger that the patient would perish from hemorrhage through the want of adhesion of the sides of the artery the profound knowledge of healthy and of diseased structure and of the laws of the animal economy by which both are regulated which john hunter had acquired from anatomy suggested to this eminent man a mode of operating the effect of which in preserving human life has placed him high in the rank of the benefactors of his race this consummate anatomist saw that the reason why death so often followed the common operation was because that process which was essential to his success was prevented by the diseased condition of the artery he perceived that the vessel at some distance from the aneurysm was in a sound state and conceived that if the ligature were applied to this distant part that is to a sound instead of a diseased portion of the artery this necessary process would not be counteracted to this there was one capital objection that it would often be necessary to apply the ligature around the main trunk of an artery before it gives off its branches in consequence of which the parts below the ligature would be deprived of their supply of blood and would therefore mortify so frequent and great are the communications between all the arteries of the body however that he thought it probable that a sufficient supply would be borne to those parts through the medium of collateral branches for an aneurysm in the ham he therefore boldly cut down upon the main trunk of the artery which supplies the lower extremity and applied a ligature around it where it is seated near the middle of the thigh in the confident expectation that though he thus deprived the limb of the supply of blood which it received through its direct channel it would not perish his knowledge of the processes of the animal economy led him to expect that the force of the circulation being thus taken off from the aneurysmal sac the progress of the disease would be stopped that the sac itself with all its contents would be absorbed that by this means the whole tumour would be removed and that an opening into it would be unnecessary the most complete success followed this noble experiment and the sensations which this philosopher experienced when he witnessed the event must have been exquisite and have constituted an appropriate reward for the application of profound knowledge to the mitigation of human suffering after hunter followed abernethy who treading in the footsteps of his master for an aneurysm of the femoral placed a ligature above the external iliac artery lately the internal iliac itself has been taken up and surgeons have tied arteries of such importance that they have been themselves astonished at the extent and splendor of their success every individual on whom an operation of this kind has been successfully performed is snatched by it from certain and inevitable death 
the symptom by which an aneurysm is distinguished from every other tumor is chiefly its pulsating motion but when an aneurysm has become very large it ceases to pulsate and when an abscess is seated near an artery of great magnitude it acquires a pulsating motion because the pulsations of the artery are perceptible through the abscess the real nature of cases of this kind cannot possibly be ascertained without a most careful investigation combined with an exact knowledge of the structure and relative position of all the parts in the neighborhood of the tumor palatin one of the most distinguished surgeons of france was one day called to a man who after a long walk was seized with a severe pain in the leg over the seat of which appeared a tumor which was attended with a pulsation so violent that it lifted up the hand of the examiner there seemed every reason to suppose that the case was an aneurysmal swelling this acute observer, however, in comparing the affected with the sound limb, perceived in the latter a similar throbbing. On careful examination, he discovered that by a particular disposition in this individual, one of the main arteries of the leg, the anterior tibial, deviated from its usual course, and instead of plunging deep between the muscles, lay immediately under the skin and fascia. The truth was that the man in the exertion of walking had ruptured some muscular fibers, and the uncommon distribution of the artery gave to this accident these peculiar symptoms. The real nature of this case could not possibly have been ascertained but by an anatomist. The same surgeon has recorded the case of a man who, having fallen twice from his horse and experienced for several years considerable uneasiness in his back, was afflicted with acute pain in the abdomen. At the same time, an oval, irregularly circumscribed tumor made its appearance in the right flank. It presented a distinct fluctuation and had all the appearance of a collection of matter depending on caries of the vertebra the pain was seated chiefly at the lower portion of that part of the spine which forms the back which was moreover distorted and this might have confirmed the opinion that the case was a lumbar abscess with caries palatin however who well knew that an aneurysm as it enlarges may destroy any bone in its neighborhood saw that the disease was an aneurysm and predicted that the patient must perish on opening the body, for the man lived only ten days after Peloton first saw him, an aneurysmal tumor was discovered, which nearly filled the cavity of the abdomen. If this case had been mistaken for lumbar abscess, and the tumor had been opened with a view of affording an exit to the matter, the man would have died in a few seconds. There is no surgeon of discernment or experience whose attention has not been awakened and whose sagacity has not been put to the test by the occurrence of similar cases in his own practice. The consequence of error is almost always instantaneously fatal. The catalogue of such disastrous events is long and melancholy. Richerand has recorded that Farrand, head surgeon of the Hôtel Dieu, mistook an aneurysm in the armpit for an abscess, plunged his knife into the swelling, and killed the patient. Dehan speaks of a person who died in consequence of an opening which was made, contrary to the advice of Burhava, in a similar tumor at the knee. Vesalius was consulted about a tumor in the back, which he pronounced to be an aneurysm, but an ignorant practitioner, having made an opening into it, the patient instantly bled to death. Nothing can be more easy than to confound an aneurysm of the artery of the neck with the swelling of the glands in its neighborhood with a swelling of the cellular substance which surrounds the artery, with abscesses of various kinds but if a surgeon were to fall into this error and to open a carotid aneurysm his patient would certainly be dead in the space of a few moments it must be evident then that a thorough knowledge of anatomy is not only indispensable to the proper treatment of cases of this description but also to the prevention of the most fatal mistakes 
there is nothing in surgery of more importance than the proper treatment of hemorrhage of the confusion and terror occasioned by the sight of a human being from whom the blood is gushing in torrents and whose condition none of the spectators is able to relieve no one can form an adequate conception but those who have witnessed it in all such cases there is one thing proper to be done the prompt performance of which is generally as certainly successful as the neglect of it is inevitably fatal it is impossible to conceive of a more terrible situation than that of a medical man who knows not what to do on such an emergency he is confused he hesitates while he is deciding what measures to adopt the patient expires he can never think of that man's death without horror for he is conscious that but for his ignorance he might have averted his patient's fate the ancient surgeons were constantly placed in this situation and the dread inspired by it retarded the progress of surgery more than all other causes put together not only were they terrified from interfering with the most painful and destructive diseases which experience has proved to be capable of safe and easy removal but they were afraid to cut even the most trivial tumour when they ventured to remove a part they attempted it only by means of the ligature or by the application of burning irons when they determined to amputate they never thought of doing so until the limb had mortified and the dead had separated from the living parts for they were absolutely afraid to cut into the living flesh they had no means of stopping hemorrhage but by the application of astringents to the bleeding vessels remedies which were inert or of burning irons or boiling turpentine expedients which were not only inert but cruel surgeons now know that the grand means of stopping hemorrhage is compression of the bleeding vessel if pressure be made on the trunk of an artery though blood be flowing from a thousand branches given off from it the bleeding will cease should the situation of the artery be such as to allow of effectual external pressure nothing further is requisite the pressure being applied the bleeding is stopped at once should the situation of the vessel place it beyond the reach of external pressure it is necessary to cut down upon it and to secure it by the application of a ligature pare may be pardoned for supposing that he was led to the discovery of this invaluable remedy by the inspiration of the deity by means of it the most formidable operations may be undertaken with the utmost confidence because the wounded vessels can be secured the moment they are cut by the same means the most frightful hemorrhages may be most effectually stopped and even when the bleeding is so violent as to threaten immediate death it may often be averted by the simple expedient of placing the finger upon the wounded vessel until there is time to tie it but it is obvious that none of these expedients can be employed and that these bleedings can neither be checked at the moment nor permanently stopped without such a knowledge of the course of the trunks and branches of vessels as can be acquired only by the study of anatomy the success of amputation is closely connected with the knowledge of the means of stopping hemorrhage not to amputate is often to abandon the patient to a certain and miserable death and all that the surgeon formerly did was to watch the progress of that death he had no power to stop or even to retard it the fate of sir philip sidney is a melancholy illustration of this truth this noble-minded man the light and glory of his age was cut off in the bloom of manhood and the midst of his usefulness by the wound of a musket bullet in his left leg a little above the knee when extraction of the ball or amputation of the limb says his biographer would have saved his inestimable life but the surgeons and physicians were unwilling to practise the one and knew not how to perform the other he was variously tormented by a number of surgeons and physicians for three weeks 
amputation indeed was never attempted except where mortification had itself half performed the operation the just apprehension of an hemorrhage which there was no adequate means of stopping checked the hand of the boldest surgeon and quailed the courage of the most daring patient and if ever the operation was resorted to almost always proved fatal the patient generally expired according to the expression of celsus in ipso opere how could it be otherwise the surgeon cut through the flesh of his patient with a red-hot knife this was his only means of stopping the hemorrhage by this expedient he sought to convert the whole surface of the stump into an escar but this operation painful in its execution and terrible in its consequences when it even appeared to succeed succeeded only for a few days for the bleeding generally returned and proved fatal as soon as the sloughs or dead parts became loose plunging the stump into boiling oil into boiling turpentine into boiling pitch for all these means were used was attended with no happier result and after unspeakable suffering almost every patient perished in the manner in which amputation is performed at present not more than one person in twenty loses his life in consequence of the operation even taking into the account all the cases in which it is practised in hospitals in private practice where many circumstances favor its success it is computed that ninety-five persons out of a hundred recover from it when it is performed at a proper time and in a proper manner it seems impossible to exhibit a more striking illustration of the great value of anatomical knowledge but if there be any disease which from the frequency of its occurrence from the variety of its forms from the difficulty of discriminating between it and other maladies and from the danger attendant on almost all its varieties requires a combination of the most minute investigation with the most accurate anatomical knowledge it is that of hernia this disease consists of a protrusion of some of the viscera of the abdomen from the cavity in which they are naturally contained into a preternatural bag composed of the portion of the peritoneum the membrane which lines the abdomen which is pushed before them it is computed that one sixteenth of the human race are afflicted with this malady it is sometimes merely an inconvenient complaint attended with no evil consequences whatever but there is no form of this disease which is not liable to be suddenly changed and by slight causes from a perfectly innocent state into a condition which may prove fatal in a few hours the disease itself occurs in numerous situations it may be confounded with various diseases it may exist in the most diversified states it may require without the loss of a single moment a most important and delicate operation and it may appear to demand this operation while the performance of it may really be not only useless but highly pernicious the danger of hernia depends on its passing into that state which is technically termed strangulation when a protruded intestine suffers such a degree of pressure as to occasion a total obstruction to the passage of its contents it is said to be strangulated the consequence of pressure thus producing strangulation is the excitement of inflammation this inflammation must inevitably prove fatal unless the pressure be promptly removed in most cases this can be effected only by the operation two things then are indispensable first the ability to ascertain that the symptoms are really produced by pressure that is to distinguish the disease from the affections which resemble it and secondly when this is effected to perform the operation with promptitude and success the distinction of strangulated hernia from affections which resemble it often requires the most exact knowledge and the most minute investigation the intestine included in a hernial sac may be merely affected with colic and thus give rise to the appearance of strangulation it may be in a state of irritation produced for example by unusual fatigue and from this cause may be attacked with the symptoms of inflammation 
Inflammation may be excited in the intestine by the common causes of inflammation which the hernia may have no share in inducing, and of which it may not even participate. Were this case mistaken and the operation performed, it would not only be useless, but pernicious while the attention of the practitioner would be diverted from the real nature of the malady. The prompt and vigorous application of the remedies, which alone could save the patient, would be neglected, and he would probably perish. On the other hand, a very small portion of intestine may become strangulated and urgently require the operation, but there may be no tumor. All the symptoms may be those, and on a superficial examination, only those of inflammation of the bowels. Were the real nature of this case mistaken, death would be inevitable. Nothing is more common than fatal errors of this kind. It is only a few months ago that a physician was called in haste to a person who was said to be dying of inflammation of the bowels. Before he reached the house, the man was dead. He had been ill only three days. On looking at the abdomen, there was a manifest hernia. The first glance was sufficient to ascertain the fact. The practitioner in attendance had known nothing of the matter, he had never suspected the real nature of the disease, and had made no inquiry which could have led to the detection of it. Here was a case which might probably have been saved, but for the criminal ignorance and inattention of the practitioner. Whenever there are symptoms of inflammation of the bowels, examination of the abdomen is indispensable, and the life of the patient will depend on the care and accuracy with which the investigation is made. But it is possible that inflammation may attack the parts included in the hernial sac, without arising from the hernia itself. The inflammation may be produced by the common causes of inflammation. There may be no pressure, there may be no strangulation. The swelling may be the seat, not the cause, of the disease. In this case, too, the operation would be both useless and pernicious. Now all these are diversities which it is of the highest importance to discriminate. In some of them, life depends on the clearness, accuracy, and promptitude with which the discrimination is made. Promptitude is of no less consequence than accuracy. If the decision be not formed and acted on at once, it will be of no avail. The rapidity of the progress of this disease is often frightful. We have mentioned a case in which it was fatal in three days, but it not unfrequently terminates fatally in less than twenty-four hours. Sir Astley Cooper mentions a case in which the patient was dead in eight hours after the commencement of the disease. Larry has recorded the case of a soldier in whom a hernia took place which was strangulated immediately. He was brought to the ambulance instantly and perished in two hours with gangrene of the part and of the abdominal viscera. This was the second instance which had occurred to this surgeon of a rapidity thus appalling. What clearness of judgment, what accuracy of knowledge, what promptitude of decision are necessary to treat such a disease with any chance of success? The moment that a case is ascertained to be strangulated hernia, an attempt must be made to liberate the parts from the stricture and to replace them in their natural situation. This is first attempted by the hand, and the operation is technically termed the taxis. The patient must be placed in a particular position. Pressure must be made in a particular direction. It is impossible to ascertain either without an accurate knowledge of the parts. If pressure be made in a wrong direction and in a rough and unscientific manner, the organs protruded instead of being urged through a proper opening are bruised against the parts which oppose their return. Many cases are on record in which gangrene and even rupture of the intestines have been occasioned in this manner. When the parts cannot be returned by the hand, assisted by those remedies which experience has proved to be beneficial, the operation must be performed without the delay of a moment. To its proper performance, two things are necessary. First, a minute anatomical knowledge of the various and complicated parts which are implicated in it, and secondly, a steady, firm, and delicate command of the knife. 
in the first place the integuments must be divided the cellular substance which intervenes between the skin and the hernial sac must be removed layer by layer with the knife and the dissecting forceps the sac itself must be opened this part of the operation must be performed with the most extreme caution the sac being laid open the protruded organs are now exposed to view the operator must next ascertain the exact point where the stricture exists having discovered its seat he must make his incision with a particular instrument in a certain direction to a definite extent on account of the nature of the parts implicated in the operation and the proximity of vessels life depends on an exact knowledge and a precise and delicate attention to all these circumstances how can this knowledge be obtained how can this dexterity be acquired without a profound acquaintance with anatomy and how can this be acquired without frequent and laborious dissection the eye must become familiar with the appearance of the integuments with the appearance of the cellular substance beneath it with the appearance of the hernial sac and of the changes which it undergoes by disease with the appearance of the various viscera contained in it and of their changes and the hand must pay that steady and prompt obedience to the judgment which nothing but knowledge and the consciousness of knowledge can command even this is not all when the operation has been performed thus far with perfect skill and success the most opposite measures are required according to the actual state of the organs contained in the sac if they are agglutinated together if portions of them are in a state of mortification to return them into the cavity of the abdomen in that condition would in general be certain death preternatural adhesion must be removed mortified portions must be cut away but how can this possibly be done without an acquaintance with healthy and diseased structure and how can this be obtained without dissecting the organs in a state of health and of disease it has been stated that the progress of strangulated hernia to a fatal termination is often frightfully rapid in certain cases to delay the operation even for a very short period is therefore to lose the only chance of success but ignorant and half-informed surgeons are afraid to operate they are conscious that the operation is one of immense importance they know that in the hands of an operator ignorant of anatomy it is one of extreme hazard they therefore put off the time as long as possible they have recourse to every expedient they resort to everything but the only efficient remedy and when at last they are compelled by a secret sense of shame to try that it is too late all the best practical surgeons express themselves in the strongest language on the importance of performing the operation early if it be performed at all on this point there is a perfect accordance between the most celebrated practitioners on the continent and the great surgeons of our own country all represent in many parts of their writings the dangerous and fatal effects of delay mr hay in his practical observations states that when he first began to practice he considered the operation as the last resource and only to be employed when the danger appeared imminent by this dilatory mode of practice says he i lost three patients in five upon whom the operation was performed having more experience of the urgency of the disease i made it my custom when called to a patient who had labored two or three days under the disease to wait only about two hours that i might try the effect of bleeding if that evacuation was not forbidden by some peculiar circumstance of the case and the tobacco clister in this mode of practice i lost about two patients in nine upon whom i operated this comparison is drawn from cases nearly similar leaving out of the account those cases in which gangrene of the intestine had taken place i have now at the time of writing this performed the operation thirty-five times and have often had occasion to lament that i performed it too late but never that i had performed it too soon 
these observations are sufficient to show the importance of anatomy in certain surgical diseases the state of medical opinion from the earliest ages to the present time furnishes a most instructive proof of its necessity to the detection and cure of disease in general the doctrines of the father of physic are in the highest degree vague and unmeaning everything is resolved by hippocrates into a general principle which he terms nature and to which he ascribes intelligence which he clothes with the attributes of justice and which he represents as possessing virtues and powers which he says are her servants and by means of which she performs all her operations in the bodies of animals distributes the blood spirits and heat through all the parts of the body and imparts to them life and sensation he states that the manner in which she acts is by attracting what is good or agreeable to each species and retaining preparing and changing it or on the other hand by rejecting whatever is superfluous or hurtful after she has separated it from the good this is the foundation of the doctrine of deparation concoction and crisis in fevers so much insisted on by him and by other physicians after him but when he explains what he means by nature he resolves it into heat which he says appears to have something immortal in it the great opponent of hippocrates was asclepiades he asserted that matter considered in itself is of an unchangeable nature that all perceptible bodies are composed of a number of small ones termed corpuscles between which there are interspersed an infinity of small spaces totally devoid of matter that the soul itself is composed of these corpuscles that what is called nature is nothing more than matter and motion that hippocrates knew not what he said when he spoke of nature as an intelligent being and ascribed to her various qualities and virtues that the corpuscles of which all bodies are composed are of different figures and consist of different assemblages that all bodies contain numerous pores or interstices which are of different sizes that the human body like all other bodies possesses pores peculiar to itself that these pores are larger or smaller according as the corpuscles which pass through them differ in magnitude that the blood consists of the largest and the spirits and the heat of the smallest on these principles asclepiades founded his theory of medicine he maintains that as long as the corpuscles are freely received by the pores the body remains in its natural state that on the contrary as soon as any obstacle obstructs their passage it begins to recede from that state that therefore health depends on the just proportion between these pores and corpuscles that on the contrary disease proceeds from a disproportion between them that the most usual obstacle arises from a retention of some of the corpuscles in their ordinary passages where they arrive in too large a number or are of irregular figures or move too fast or proceed too slow that frenzies lethargies pleurisies burning fevers for example are occasioned by these corpuscles stopping of their own accord that pain is produced by the stagnation of the largest of all these corpuscles of which the blood consists that on the contrary deliriums languors extenuations leanness and dropsies derive their origin from a bad state of the pores which are too much relaxed or opened that dropsy in particular proceeds from the flesh being perforated with various small holes which convert the nourishment received into them into water that hunger is occasioned by an opening of the large pores of the stomach and belly that thirst arises from an opening of the small pores that intermittent fevers have the same origin that quotidian fever is produced by a retention of the largest corpuscles tertian fever by a retention of corpuscles somewhat smaller and quartan fever by a retention of the smallest corpuscles of all galen maintained that the animal body is composed of three principles namely the solids the humours and the spirits that the solid parts consist of similar and organic 
that the humours are four in number, namely the blood, the phlegm, the yellow bile, and the black bile, that the spirits are of three kinds, namely the vital, the animal, and the natural, that the vital spirit is a subtle vapour which arises from the blood, and which derives its origin from the liver, the organ of sanguification, that the spirits thus formed are conveyed to the heart, where in conjunction with the air drawn into the lungs by respiration, they become the matter of the second species, namely of the vital spirits, that in their turn the vital spirits are changed into the animal in the brain, and so on. At last came Paracelsus, who was believed to have discovered the elixir of life, and who is the very prince of charlatans. He delivered a course of lectures on the theory and practice of physic in the University of Basel, which he commenced by burning the works of Galen and Avicenna in the presence of his auditory. He assured his hearers that his shoe latchets had more knowledge than both these illustrious authors put together, that all the academies in the world had not so much experience as his beard, and that the hair on the back of his neck was more learned than the whole tribe of authors it was fitting that a person of such splendid pretensions should have a magnificent name he therefore called himself philippus aureolus theophrastus paracelsus bombast von honanheim he was a great chemist and like other chemists he was a little too apt to carry into other sciences the smoke and tarnish of the furnace he conceived that the elements of the living systems were the same as those of his laboratory, and that sulphur, salt, and quicksilver were the constituents of organized bodies. He taught that these constituents were combined by chemical operations, that their relations were governed by Archaeus, a demon, who performed the part of alchemist in the stomach, who separated the poisonous from the nutritive part of the food, and who communicated the tincture by which the food became capable of assimilation, that this governor of the stomach, this spiritus vitae, this astral body of man, was the immediate cause of all diseases and chief agent in their cure, that each member of the body had its peculiar stomach by which the work of secretion was effected, that diseases were produced by certain influences, of which there were five, in particular, viz. ens estral, ens venini, ens naturale, ens spirituale, and ens diale that when Archaeus was sick, putrescence was occasioned, and that either localitur or imancalitur, and etc., etc., etc. It would be leading to a detail which is incompatible with our present purpose to follow these speculations, or to give an account of the doctrines of the mechanical physician, who believed that every operation of the animal economy was explained by comparing it to a system of ropes, levers, and pulleys, united with a number of rigid tubes of different lengths and diameters, containing fluids which, from variations in their impelling causes, moved with different degrees of velocity, or of the chemical physicians whose manner of theorizing and investigating would have qualified them better for the occupation of the brewer or of the distiller than for that of the physician. All these speculations are idle fancies without any evidence whatever to support them, and it has been argued that for this very reason they must have been without any practical result, and that therefore, if they were productive of no benefit, they were at least innocuous. No opinion can be more false or pernicious. These wretched theories not only preoccupied the mind, prevented it from observing the real phenomena of health and of disease, and the actual effect of the remedies which were employed, and thus put an effectual stop to the progress of the science, but they were productive of the most direct and serious evils. It is no less true in medicine than in philosophy and morals that there is no such thing as innocuous error that men's opinions invariably influence their conduct and that physicians like other men act as they think Asclepiades, whose mind was full of corpuscles and interstices, was intent on finding suitable remedies, which he discovered in gestation, friction, and the use of wine. 
by various exercises he proposed to render the pores more open and to make the juices and corpuscles the retention of which causes disease to pass more freely hence he used gestation from the very beginning of the most burning fevers he laid it down as a maxim that one fever was to be cured by another that the strength of the patient was to be exhausted by making him watch and endure thirst to such a degree that for the first two days of the disorder he would not allow them to cool their mouths with a drop of water abernethy's regulated diet is luxurious compared to his plan of abstinence for the three first days he allowed his patients no aliment whatever on the fourth he so far relented as to give to some of them a small portion of food but from others he absolutely withheld all nourishment till the seventh day and this is the gentleman who laid it down as a maxim that all diseases are to be cured tuto celeriter et jacunda to be sure, he was a believer in the doctrine of compensation, and in the latter stage of their diseases endeavored to recompense his patients for the privation he caused them to endure in the beginning of their illness. Celsus observes that, though he treated his patients like a butcher during the first days of the disorder, he afterwards indulged them so far as to give directions for making their beds in the softest manner he allowed them abundance of wine which he gave freely in all fevers he did not forbid it even to those afflicted with frenzy nay he ordered them to drink it till they were intoxicated for said he it is absolutely necessary that persons who labour under frenzy should sleep and wine has a narcotic quality to lethargic patients he prescribed it with great freedom but with the opposite purpose of rousing them from their stupor his great remedy in dropsy was friction which of course he employed to open the pores with the same view he enjoined active exercise to the sick but what is a little extraordinary he denied it to those in health aristotus who was a great speculator and whose theories had the most important influence on his practice banished bloodletting altogether from medicine for the following notable reasons because he says we cannot always see the vein we intend to open because we are not sure we may not open an artery instead of a vein because we cannot ascertain the true quantity to be taken because if we take too little the intention is not answered if too much we may destroy the patient and because the evacuation of the venous blood is succeeded by that of the spirits which thus pass from the arteries into the veins wherefore bloodletting ought never to be used as a remedy in disease yet though he was thus cautious in abstracting blood it must not be supposed that he was not a sufficiently bold practitioner in tumour of the liver he hesitated not to cut open the abdomen and to apply his medicines immediately to the diseased organ but though he took such liberties with the liver he regarded with the greatest apprehension the operation of tapping in dropsy of the abdomen because said he the waters being evacuated the liver which is inflamed and become hard like a stone is more pressed by the adjacent parts which the waters kept at a distance from it whence the patient dies one physician conceived that gout originated from an effervescence of the synovia of the joints with the vitriolated blood whence he recommended alcohol for its cure a remedy for which the court of aldermen ought to have voted him a medal a more ancient practitioner who believed that the finger of st blasius was very efficacious for removing a bone which sticks in the throat maintained that gout was the grand dryer and prescribed a remedy for it which the patient was to use for a whole year and to observe the following diet each month in september he must eat and drink milk in october he must eat garlic in november he is to abstain from bathing in december he must eat no cabbage in january he is to take a glass of pure wine in the morning in february to eat no beef in march to mix several things both in eatables and drinkables in april not to eat horseradish nor in may the fish called polypius 
in june he is to drink cold water in a morning in july to avoid venery and lastly in august to eat no mallows a third physician deduced all diseases from inspissation of the fluids hence he attached the highest importance to diluent drinks and believed that tea especially is a sovereign remedy in almost every disease to which the human frame is subject tea says bentocchi who is loudest in his praise of this panacea and who as blumenbach observes deserve to have been pensioned by the east india company for his services tea is the best nay the only remedy for correcting viscidity of the blood the source of all diseases and for dissipating the acid of the stomach as it contains a fine oleaginous volatile salt and certain subtle spirits which are analogous in their nature to the animal spirits tea fortifies the memory and all the intellectual faculties it will therefore furnish the most effectual means of improving physical education against fever there is no better remedy than forty or fifty cups of tea swallowed immediately after one another the slime of the pancreas is thus carried off another physician derived all his diseases from a redundancy or deficiency of fire and water he maintained that where the water predominated the fluids became viscid and that hence arose intermittent fevers and arthritic complaints his remedies are in strict conformity to his theory these diseases are to be cured by volatile salts which abound with fiery particles venous section in any case is highly pernicious these fiery medicines are the only efficacious remedies and are to be employed even in diseases of the most inflammatory nature life says dr brown is a forced state it is a flame kept alive by excitement everything stimulates some substances too violently others not sufficiently there are thus two kinds of debility indirect and direct and to one or other of these causes must be referred the origin of all diseases according to this doctrine the mode of cure is simple we have nothing to do but to supply to moderate or to abstract stimuli typhus fever in this system is a disease of extreme debility we must therefore give the strongest stimulants consumption and apoplexy also are diseases of debility of course the remedies are active stimulants humanity shudders and with reason at the application of such doctrines to practice and not less destitute of reason and not less dangerous in practice is the great doctrine of debility promulgated by cullen this celebrated professor taught that the circumstances which invariably characterized fever that which constituted its essence was debility the inference was obvious that above all things the strength must be supported the consequence was that bloodletting was neglected and that bark and wine were given in immense quantities in cases in which intense inflammation existed the practice was in the highest degree mortal the number of persons who have perished in consequence of this doctrine is incalculable so far then is it from being true that medical theories are of no practical importance there is the closest possible connection between the speculations of the physician in his closet and the measures which he adopts at the bedside of his patient truth to him is a benignant power which stops the progress of disease protracts the duration of life and mitigates the suffering it may be unable to remove error is a fearfully active and tremendously potent principle there is not a medical prejudice which has not slain its thousands nor a false theory which has not immolated its tens of thousands the system of medicine and surgery which is established in any country has a greater influence over the lives of its inhabitants than the epidemic diseases produced by its climate or the decisions of its government concerning peace and war 
the devastations of the yellow fever will bear no comparison with the ravages committed by the brunonian system and the slaughter of the field of waterloo counts not of victims a tithe of the number of which the collinian doctrine of debility can justly boast anatomy alone will not teach a physician to think much less to think justly but it will give him the elements of thinking it will furnish him with the means of correcting his errors it will certainly save him from some delusions and will afford to the public the best shield against his ignorance which may be fatal and against his presumption which may be devastating we have entered into this minute detail at the hazard we are aware of tiring the reader but in the hope of leaving on his mind a more distinct impression of the importance of anatomical knowledge than could possibly be produced by a mere allusion to the circumstances which have been explained in all ages formidable obstacles have opposed the prosecution of anatomical investigations among these without doubt the most powerful has its source in a feeling which is natural to the heart of man the sweetest the most sacred associations are indissolubly connected with the person of those we love it is with the corporeal frame that our senses have been familiar it is that on which we have gazed with rapture it is that which has so often been the medium of conveying to our hearts the thrill of ecstasy we cannot separate the idea of the peculiarities and actions of a friend from the idea of his person it is for this reason that everything which has been associated with him acquires a value from that consideration his ring his watch his books and his habitation the value of these as having been his is not merely fictitious they have an empire over my mind they can make me happy or unhappy they can torture and they can tranquilize they can purify my sentiments and make me similar to the man i love they possess the virtue which the indian is said to attribute to the spoils of him he kills and inspire me with the power the feelings and the heart of their preceding master it is nothing says the survivor to tell me when disease completed its work and death has seized its prey that that body with which are connected so many delightful sensations is a senseless mass of matter that it is no longer my friend that the spirit which animated it and rendered it lovely to my sight and dear to my affections is gone i know that it is gone i know that i never more shall see the light of intelligence brighten that countenance nor benevolence beam in that eye nor the voice of affection sound from those lips that which i loved and which loved me is not there but here are still the features of my friend this is his form and the very particles of matter which compose this dull mass a few hours ago were a real part of him and i cannot separate them in my imagination from him and i approach them with the profounder reverence i gaze upon them with the deeper affection because they are all that remain to me i would give all that i possess to purchase the art of preserving the wholesome character and rosy hue of this form that it might be my companion still but this is impossible i cannot detain it from the tomb but when i have cast a heap of mould upon the person of my friend and taken the cold earth for its keeper i visit the spot in which it is deposited with awe it is sacred to my imagination it is dear to my heart there is a real and deep foundation for these feelings in human nature they arise spontaneously in the bosom of man and we see their expression and their power in the customs of all nations savage as well as civilized and in the conduct of all men the most ignorant and uncultivated no less than the most intelligent and refined it has been the policy of society to foster these sentiments 
it has been conceived that the sanctity which attaches to the dead is reflected back in a profounder feeling of respect for the living that the solemnity with which death is regarded elevates in the general estimation the value of life and that he who cannot approach the mortal remains of a fellow-creature without an emotion of awe must regard with horror everything which places in danger the life of a human being religion has contributed indirectly but powerfully to the strength and perpetuity of these impressions and superstition has availed herself of them to play her antics and to accomplish her base and malignant purposes it is not the eradication of these feelings that can be desired but their control it is not the extinction of these natural and useful emotions that is pleaded for but they should give way to higher considerations when these exist veneration for the dead is connected with the noblest and sweetest sympathies of our nature but the promotion of the happiness of the living is a duty from which we can never be exonerated in antient times the voice of reason could not be heard superstition and customs founded on superstition excited an influence which was neither to be resisted nor evaded dissection was then regarded with horror in the warm countries of the east the pursuit must have been highly offensive and even dangerous and it was absolutely incompatible with the notions and ceremonies universally prevalent in those days the jewish tenant of pollution must have formed an insuperable obstacle to the cultivation of anatomy amongst that people by the egyptians every one who cut open a dead body was regarded with inexpressible horror the grecian philosophers so far overcame the prejudice as occasionally to engage in the pursuit and the first dissection on record was one made by democritus of abdera the friend of hippocrates in order to discover the course of the bile the romans contributed nothing to the progress of the art they were content with propitiating the deities who presided over health and disease they erected on the palatine mount a temple to the goddess febris whom they worshipped from a dread of her power they also sacrificed to the goddess osopaga who it seems presided over the growth of the bones and to another styled carna who took care of the viscera and to whom they offered bean broth and bacon because these were the most nutritious articles of diet the arabians adopted the jewish notion of pollution and were thus prohibited by the tenets of their religion from practising dissection abdolophilic who flourished about the year twelve hundred a man of learning and a teacher of anatomy never saw and never thought of a human dissection in order to examine and demonstrate the bones he took his students to burying grounds and earnestly recommended them instead of reading books to adopt that method of study yet he seemed to have no conception that the dissection of a recent subject might be a still better method of learning christians were equally hostile to dissection pope boniface the eighth issued a bull prohibiting even the maceration and preparation of skeletons the priests were the only physicians and so greatly did they abuse the office they assumed that the evil at length became too intolerable to be borne the church itself was obliged to prohibit the priesthood from interfering with the practice of medicine all monks and canons who applied themselves to physic were threatened with severe penalties and all bishops abbots and priors who connived at their misconduct were ordered to be suspended from their ecclesiastical functions but it was not till three hundred years after this interdiction that by a special bull which permitted physicians to marry their complete separation from the clergy was effected in the fourteenth century mundanus professor at bologna astonished the world by the public dissection of two human bodies in the fifteenth century leonardo da vinci contributed essentially to the progress of the art by the introduction of anatomical plates which were admirably executed in the sixteenth century the emperor charles v 
ordered a consultation to be held by the divines of Salamanca to determine whether it was lawful in point of conscience to dissect a dead body in order to learn its structure. In the 17th century, Cortesius, professor of anatomy at Bologna and afterwards professor of medicine at Messina, had long begun a treatise on practical anatomy, which he had an earnest desire to finish, but so great was the difficulty of prosecuting the study, even in Italy, that in twenty-four years he could only twice procure an opportunity of dissecting a human body, and even then with difficulty and in hurry, whereas he had expected to have done so once every year, according to the custom of the famous academies of Italy in muscovy until very lately both anatomy and the use of skeletons were positively forbidden the first as inhuman and the latter as subservient to witchcraft even the illustrious luther was so biased by the prejudices of his age that he ascribed the majority of the diseases to the arts of the devil and found great fault with physicians when they attempted to account for them by natural causes england acquired the bad fame of being the country of witches and opposed almost insuperable obstacles to the cultivation of anatomy even at present the prejudices of the people on this subject are violent and deeply rooted the measure of that violence may be estimated by the degree of abhorrence with which they regard those persons who are employed to procure the subjects necessary for dissection in this country there is no other method of obtaining subjects but that of exhumation aversion to this employment may be pardoned dislike to the persons who engage in it is natural but to regard them with detestation to exult in their punishment to determine for themselves its nature and measure and to endeavour to assume the power of inflicting it with their own hands is absurd magistrates have too often fostered the prejudices of the people and afforded them the means of executing their vengeance on the objects of their aversion the press has uniformly allied itself with the ignorance and violence of the vulgar and has done everything in its power to inflame the passions which it was its duty to endeavour to soothe it is notorious that the winter before last there was scarcely a week in which the papers did not contain the most exaggerated and disgusting statements the appetite which could be gratified with such representations was sufficiently degraded but still more base was the servility which could pander to it half a century ago there was in scotland no difficulty in obtaining the subjects which were necessary to supply the schools of anatomy the consequence was that medicine and surgery assumed new life started from the torpor in which they had been spellbound and made an immediate and rapid and brilliant progress the new seminaries constantly sent into the world men of the most splendid abilities at once demonstrating the excellence of the schools in which they were educated and rendering them illustrious pupils flocked to them from all quarters of the globe and they essentially contributed to that advancement of science which the present age has witnessed in the nineteenth century the good people of scotland that intelligent that cool and calculating that most reasonable and thinking people have thought proper to return to the worst feeling and the worst conduct of the darkest periods of antiquity there is at present no offence whatever which seems to have such power to heat and exalt into a kind of torrent the blood which usually flows so calmly and sluggishly in the veins of a scotchman the people of eighteen twenty three to compare great things with small emulate the spirit of those of their forefathers who were out in the forty five the object to be sure is somewhat different but it is amusing to see the intensity and seriousness of the excitement about twelve months ago an honest farmer of the name of scott who resides at linthago apprehended a poor white who was pursuing his vocation we presume in the churchyard of that place and this service appeared so meritorious to the people in his neighbourhood that they absolutely presented him with a piece of plate 
in the winter sessions of eighteen twenty two and three a body was discovered on its way to the lecture room of an anatomist in glasgow and in spite of the exertions of the police aided by those of the military this gentleman's premises and their contents which were valuable were entirely destroyed by the mob for some time after this achievement it was necessary to station a military guard at the houses of all the medical professors in that city in the spring circuit of the judiciary court last year at stirling while the judges were proceeding to the court the procession was assaulted with missiles several persons were injured and it was necessary to call in the protection of a military force the object of the mob was to inflict summary punishment on a man who was about to be tried for the exhumation of a body we happen to know that the most disgraceful proceedings were some time ago instituted in that town against a young gentleman of respectable family and connections who was in fact expatriated and whose prospects in life were entirely changed if not ruined because he had too much honour to implicate his instructors in a transaction which would have put them to an inconvenience and in which they had engaged from a desire faithfully to discharge their duty to their pupils within the last five years three men were lodged in the county jail in headington charged with a trespass in the churchyard of that town so enraged was the mob against them that an attempt was made to force the jail in order to get at them on their way to the court the men were again attacked forced from the carriage and severely maimed after examination they were admitted to bail but when set at liberty they were assailed with more violence than ever and were nearly killed on the twenty ninth of june eighteen twenty three being sunday a most extraordinary outrage was perpetrated in the streets of edinburgh a coach containing an empty coffin and two men was observed proceeding along the south bridge the people suspecting that it was intended to convey a body taken from some churchyard seized the coach it was with difficulty that the police protected the men from the assaults of the populace the coach they had no power to preserve the horses were taken from it and together with the coffin after having been trundled a mile and a half through the streets of the city it was deliberately projected over the steep side of the mound and smashed into a thousand pieces the people following it to the bottom kindled a fire with its fragments and surrounded it like the savages in robinson crusoe till it was entirely consumed in this case there was no foundation for their suspicions the coffin was intended to have conveyed to his house in edinburgh the body of a physician who that morning had died in a cottage near the neighbourhood a similar assault was some time ago made on two american gentlemen who went to visit the abbey of linthigo after nightfall the churchyards of the good scots are now strictly guarded by men and dogs watch-towers are erected within the grounds and mortisafes as they are called that is to say strong iron frames are deposited in the ground over the graves these people sometimes declare that they will put an end to anatomy and certainly they are succeeding in the accomplishment of this menace as rapidly as they can well desire the average number of medical students in edinburgh is seven hundred each session for several years past the difficulty of procuring subjects in that place has been so great that out of all that number not more than a hundred and fifty or two hundred have ever attempted to dissect and even these have latterly been so opposed in their endeavours to prosecute their studies that many of them have left the place in disgust we have been informed by a friend that he alone was personally acquainted with twenty individuals who retired from it at the beginning of last session and who went to pursue their studies in dublin and we know that vast numbers followed their example at the end of the winter course the medical school at edinburgh in fact is now subsisting entirely on its past reputation in the course of a few years it will be entirely at an end unless the system be changed 
let those who have the prosperity of the university at heart and who have the power to protect it consider this before it be too late they may be assured it is no idle prediction for we give them notice that it is at this moment the universal opinion and the current language of every well-informed medical man in england an excellent system of anatomical plates which has been well received by the profession has lately been published by mr lizars a lecturer on anatomy and physiology in edinburgh this gentleman states that he has been induced to undertake this work in order to obviate the most fatal consequences to the public as far at least as a reference to art instead of nature is capable of obviating those consequences he affirms that the difficulty of obtaining instruction from nature has arisen to such a pitch, owing to the extraordinary severity exercised by the legal authorities of the kingdom against persons employed in procuring subjects for dissection, as to threaten the ultimate destruction of medical and anatomical science in his preface to the second part of his work he apologizes to his readers for dividing one portion of it from another with which it ought to have been connected but states that he has been compelled to do so from the prejudices of the place which prevented him for upwards of five months from procuring a subject from which he might make his drawings in place of living he says in a civilized and enlightened period we appear as if we had been thrown back some centuries into the dark ages of ignorance bigotry and superstition prejudices worthy only of the multitude have been conjured up and appealed to in order to call forth popular indignation against those whose business it is to exhibit demonstratively the structure of the human body and the functions of its different organs the public journals from a vicious propensity to pander to the vulgar appetite for excitement have raked up and industriously circulated stories of exhumation of dead bodies tending to exasperate and inflame the passions of the mob and persons who by their own showing are friendly to the interests of science have in the excess of their zeal that bodies should remain undisturbed in their progress to decomposition labored to destroy in this country that art whose province it is to free living bodies from the consequences inseparable from accident and disease and which is worst of all the prejudices of the multitude have been confirmed and rendered inveterate by the proceedings in our courts of justice which have visited with the punishment due only to felons the unhappy persons necessarily employed in the present state of the law in procuring subjects for the dissecting room he then goes on to state that until anatomy be publicly sanctioned in edinburgh the school of medicine there can never flourish that upon the present system young men obtain a degree or a diploma after a year or two of grinding that is of learning by rote the answers to the questions which the examiners are in the habit of putting to the candidates that ignorant of the very elements of their profession numbers of persons thus educated annually go to the east and west indies and to the army and navy where they have the charge of hundreds of their suffering fellow-creatures to whom they are in fact the instruments of cruelty and murder in the preface to the fourth part he adds that when part two was published in the early part of the session he took occasion to express his sorrow for the degraded state of his profession and the threatened ruin of the medical school of his native place owing to the scarcity of subjects that for doing this he has incurred considerable censure that he regrets that he has yet found no reason to alter his opinion for the winter session is now near its conclusion and he candidly declares that such has been the scarcity of material that no teacher of anatomy or surgery has been able either to follow the regular plan of his course or to do his duty to his pupils the consequence of which has been that many of the students have left the school in disgust and gone either to dublin or paris 
while a still greater number deprived of the means of dissecting have contented themselves with lectures or theories and with grinding and entered on the practice of their profession ignorant of its fundamental principles much of this opposition on the part of the people arises from the present mode of procuring subjects fortunately there is in great britain no custom no superstition no law and we may add no prejudice against anatomy itself there is even a general conviction of its necessity there may be a feeling that it is a repulsive employment but it is commonly acknowledged that it must not be neglected the opposition which is made is made not against anatomy but against the practice of exhumation and this is a practice which ought to be opposed it is in the highest degree revolting it would be disgraceful to a horde of savages every feeling of the human heart arises up against it so long as no other means of procuring bodies for dissection are provided it must be tolerated but in itself it is alike odious to the ignorant and the enlightened to the most uncultivated and the most refined but the capital objection to this practice is that it necessarily creates a crime and educates a race of criminals exhumation is forbidden by the law it is indeed prohibited by no statute either in england or scotland in both it is an offence punishable at common law there is a statute of james i which makes it felony to steal a dead body for the purpose of witchcraft there is none against taking a body for the purpose of dissection in the case of the king against lynn seventeen eighty eight the court decided that the body being taken for the latter purpose did not make it less an indictable offence and that it is without doubt cognizable in a criminal court because it is an act highly indecent at the bare idea of which nature revolts it is punishable therefore by fine or imprisonment or both in scotland it is also punishable by whipping and even by transportation we expected better things of america we cannot express our astonishment and indignation when we found that the state of new york has actually made it felony to remove a dead body from the place of sepulchre for the purpose of dissection without providing in any other mode for the schools of anatomy this is worse than anything that exists in any other part of the world if these pages could meet the eye of any of our american brethren we entreat them to read with attention the facts which have been stated in the former part of this article and to consider with seriousness the mischief they are doing it will not be believed in england that such scenes could have been witnessed in america as were actually exhibited there scarcely a month ago to satisfy our readers however that we do not misrepresent the state of things in that country we transcribe the following accounts from the new york evening post of may twentieth at the late court of sessions solomon parmelee was indicted for a misdemeanor in entering potter's field and removing the covers of two coffins deposited in a pit and covered partly with earth the statute of this state making it a felony to dig up or remove a dead human body with intent to dissect it did not embrace this case because the prisoner had not dug up or removed the body mr sherman the present keeper of potter's field suspected that some person had entered it for the purpose of removing the dead and after sending for two watchmen and calling his faithful dog he went to ascertain the fact on arriving at the grave he found his suspicion confirmed and requested the person concealed in the pit to come out and show himself no answer being given mr sherman sent his dog into the pit and in the twinkling of an eye a tall stout fellow made his appearance and took to his heels across the field the night being dark he might have effected his escape had it not been for the sagacity and courage of the dog who pursued him for some distance but at last came up with him seized and held him fast until the arrival of mr sherman and the watchman who secured him 
the jury convicted the prisoner and the court sentenced him to six months imprisonment in the penitentiary the young gentleman attending the medical school of this city will take warning by this man's fate they may rest assured that the keeper of potter's field will do his duty and public justice will be executed on any man whatever may be his condition in life who is found violating the law and the decency of christian burial the same paper gives the following account of a transaction which took place at hartford in connecticut may seventeen yesterday morning two ladies were taking a walk in the south burying ground when they discovered a tape string and a piece of cloth which upon examination was found to be the piece that was laced upon miss jane benton's face who came to her death by drowning and was buried a few days since the ladies then went to the grave and found that it had been disturbed that she was taken out of her coffin and a rope around her neck the circumstance has produced great excitement in the public mind and every one is on the alert to discover the perpetrators of this unfeeling brutal act the citizens turned out in a body yesterday and interred the corpse again these scenes are highly disgraceful and disgraceful to all though not alike to all parties we do not blame the americans for abolishing the practice of exhumation but we blame them for stopping there we maintain that it is both absurd and criminal to make this practice felony without providing in some other method for the cultivation of anatomy in great britain the law against the practice of exhumation is not allowed to slumber there may be other cases which have not come to our knowledge but we have ascertained that there have been fourteen convictions for england alone during the last year the punishments inflicted have been imprisonment for various periods with fines of different sums the fines in general are heavy considering the poverty of the offenders several persons are at this moment suffering these penalties among others there is now in the jail of st albans a man who was sentenced for this offence to two years imprisonment and a fine of twenty pounds the period of his confinement has expired some time but he still remains in prison on account of his inability to pay the fine since the passing of the new vagrant act it has been the common practice to commit these offenders to hard labor for various periods very lately two men convicted of this offence were sent to the treadmill in cold bath fields one of whom died in one month after his commitment it is an error to suppose that these punishments operate to prevent exhumation their only effect is to raise the price of subjects a little reflection will show that they can have no other operation at present exhumation is the only method by which subjects for dissection can be procured but subjects for this purpose must be procured and be the difficulties what they may will be procured diseases will occur operations must be performed medical men must be educated anatomy must be studied dissections must go on unless some other means for affording a supply be adopted whatever be the law or the popular feeling neither magistrates nor judges nor juries will or can put an entire stop to the practice it is one which from the absolute necessity of the case must be allowed what is the consequence so long as the practice of exhumation continues a race of men must be trained up to violate the law these men must go out in company for the purpose of nightly plunder and plunder of the most odious kind tending in a peculiar and most alarming measure to brutify the mind and to eradicate every feeling and sentiment worthy of a man this employment becomes a school in which men are trained for the commission of the most daring and inhuman crimes its operation is similar but much worse than the nightly banding to violate the game laws because there is something in the violation of the grave which tends still more to degrade the character and to harden the heart this offence is connived at nay it is rewarded these men are absolutely paid to violate the law and paid by men of reputation and influence in society 
the transition is but too easy to the commission of other offences in the hope of similar connivance if not of similar reward it is an odious thing that the teachers of anatomy should be brought into contact with such men that they should be obliged to employ them and that they should even be in their power which they are to such a degree that they are obliged to bear with the wantonness of their tyranny and insult all the clamour against these men all the punishment inflicted on them only operate to raise the premium on the repetition of their offence this premium the teachers of anatomy are obliged to pay which these men perfectly understand who do not at all dislike the opposition which is made to their vocation it gives them no unreasonable pretext for exorbitancy in their demands in general they are men of infamous character some of them are thieves others are the companions and abettors of thieves almost all of them are extremely destitute when apprehended for the offence in question the teachers of anatomy are obliged to pay the expenses of the trial and to support their families while they are in prison whence the idea of immunity is associated in these men's minds with the violation of the law and when they do happen to incur its penalties they practically find that they and their families are provided for and this provision comes to them in the shape of a reward for the commission of their offence the operation of such a system in the minds of the individuals themselves is exceedingly pernicious and is not a little dangerous to the community moreover by the method of exhumation the supply after all is scanty it is never adequate to the wants of the schools it is of necessity precarious and it sometimes fails altogether for several months but it is of the utmost importance that it should be abundant regular and cheap the number of young men who come annually to london for the purpose of studying medicine and surgery may be about a thousand their expenses are necessarily very considerable while in town they have already paid a large sum for their apprenticeship in the country the circumstances of country practitioners in general can but ill afford protracted expenses for their sons in london few of them stay a month longer than the time prescribed by the college of surgeons but the short period they spend in london is the only time they have for acquiring the knowledge of their profession if they misspend these precious hours or if the means of employing them properly be denied them they must necessarily remain ignorant for life after they leave london they have no means of dissecting we have seen that it is by dissecting alone that they can make themselves acquainted even with the principles of their art that without it they cannot so much as avail themselves of the opportunities of improvement which experience itself may offer nor without the highest temerity perform a single operation we have seen that occasions suddenly occur which require the prompt performance of important and difficult operations we have seen that unless such operations are performed immediately and with the utmost skill life is inevitably lost in many such cases there is no time to send for other assistance if a country practitioner and most of these young men go to the country be not himself capable of doing what is proper to be done the death of the patient is certain we put it to the reader to imagine what the feelings of an ingenuous young man must be who is aware of what he ought to do but who is conscious that his knowledge is not sufficient to authorize him to attempt to perform it and who sees his patient die before him when he knows that he might be saved and that it would have been in his own power to save him had he been properly educated we put it to the reader to conceive what his own sensations would be were an ignorant surgeon with a rashness more fatal than the criminal modesty of the former to undertake an important operation suppose it were a tumour which turned out to be an aneurysm suppose it were a hernia in operating on which the epigastric artery were divided or the intestine itself wounded 
Suppose it were his mother, his wife, his sister, his child, whom he thus saw perish before his eyes. What would the reader then think of the prejudice which withholds from the surgeon that information without which the practice of his profession is murder? The study of anatomy is a severe and laborious study. The practice of dissection is on many accounts highly repulsive. It is even not without danger to life itself. Footnote. A winter never passes without proving fatal to several students who die from injuries received in dissection. End footnote. To men of clear understandings, to those especially of a philosophical turn of mind, the pursuit is its own reward. They are so fully satisfied that the more it is cultivated, the more satisfaction it will afford, that they need no stimulus to induce them to undergo the drudgery. But this is by no means the case with ordinary minds. The fatigue and disgust of the dissecting room are appalling to them, and they need the stimulus of necessity to urge them to the task. The Court of Examiners of the College of Surgeons requires from the candidates for surgical diplomas certificates that they have gone through at least two courses of dissections. The examiners at Apothecaries Hall do not require such certificates. The consequence is that many young men content themselves with attending lectures and with passing their examination at Apothecaries Hall and do not apply for a diploma at the College of Surgeons. This single fact is sufficient to demonstrate to the public that instead of throwing obstacles in the way of dissection, it is a duty which they owe to themselves to afford every possible facility to its practice and to hold out to every member of the profession the most powerful inducements to engage in it by rewarding with confidence those who cultivate anatomy by making excellence in anatomy indispensable to all offices in dispensaries and hospitals and by thus rendering it impossible for any one who is ignorant of anatomy to obtain rank in his profession when a candidate presents himself for a diploma in Denmark, in his first trial, he is put into a room with a subject, a case of instruments, and a memorandum, and informed that he is to display the anatomy of the face and neck, or that of the upper extremity, or that of the lower extremity, that by the anatomy is to be understood the blood vessels, nerves, and muscles, and that, as soon as he has accomplished his task, the professors will attend his summons to judge of his attainments. These professors are the true examiners. We shall have entered into the discussion of this subject to little purpose if we have not produced in the minds of our readers a deep conviction that anatomy ought to form an essential part of medical education, that anatomy cannot be studied without the practice of dissection, that dissection cannot be practiced without a supply of subjects, and that the manner in which that supply is obtained in England is detestable, and ought immediately to be changed. It might be changed easily. We agree with Mr. Mackenzie that legislative interference is necessary. We are satisfied that nothing will be done in England without it. The plan which Mr. Mackenzie suggests is as follows. 1. That the clause of our criminal code, by which the dissection of the dead body is made part of the punishment for murder, be repealed. 2. That exhumation of dead bodies be punishable as felony. 3. That no diploma in medicine or surgery be granted by any faculty, college, or university, except to those persons who shall produce undoubted evidence of their having carefully dissected at least five human bodies. 4. That in each of the hospitals, infirmaries, workhouses, poorhouses, foundling houses, houses of correction, and prisons of London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Dublin, and, if need be, of all other towns in Great Britain and Ireland, an apartment be appointed for the reception of the bodies of all persons dying in the said hospitals, infirmaries, workhouses, poorhouses, foundling houses, houses of correction and prisons, unclaimed by immediate relatives, 
or whose relatives decline to defray the expenses of interment. 5. That the bodies of all persons dying in these towns, and if need be, in all other towns, and also in country parishes, unclaimable by immediate relatives, or whose relatives decline to defray the expenses of interment, shall be conveyed to a mort house appointed in the said towns for their reception. 6. That no dead body shall be delivered from any hospital, infirmary, workhouse, poor house, foundling house, house of correction, prison, or mort house, for anatomical purposes, except upon the requisition of a member of the Royal College of Physicians or of Surgeons, of London, Edinburgh, or Dublin, or of the Faculty of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, and upon the payment of twenty shillings into the hands of the treasurer of the hospital, infirmary, workhouse, poorhouse, foundling house, house of correction, prison, or other officer appointed to receive the same. Parentheses. This is too large a sum. End parentheses. 7. That no dead body shall be conveyed from a hospital, infirmary, workhouse, poorhouse, foundling house, house of correction, prison, or mort house, to a school of anatomy, except in a covered bier, and between the hours of four and six in the morning. 8. That after the expiration of twenty-eight days, an officer appointed for this purpose in each of the four towns above mentioned, shall cause the remains of the dead to be placed in a coffin, removed from the school of anatomy where the dead body has been examined, to the mort house of the town, and decently buried. 9. That the expenses attending the execution of these regulations be defrayed out of fees paid by teachers and students of anatomy on receiving dead bodies from the hospitals, infirmaries, workhouses, poorhouses, foundling houses, houses of correction, prisons, and mort houses. To this plan there is but one objection, viz. that it is making the bodies of the poor public property. The answer is that the limitation in the proposed law, which the objection does not notice, entirely removes the weight of that objection. Though no maxim can be more indisputable than that those who are supported by the public die in its debt, and that their remains at least might, without injustice, be converted to the public use, yet it is not proposed to dispose in this manner of the bodies of all the poor, but only of that portion of the poor who die unclaimed and without friends, and whose appropriation to this public service could therefore afford pain to no one. If any concession and cooperation on the part of the public for this great public object is to be expected, and without concession and cooperation nothing can be done, it is not easy to conceive of any plan which requires less public concession or implies less violation of public feeling. In point of fact, it would put no indignity, it would inflict no injury on the poor. It is the rejection of it that would really and practically be unjust and cruel. The question is whether the surgeon shall be allowed to gain knowledge by operating on the bodies of the dead, or driven to obtain it by practicing on the bodies of the living. If the dead bodies of the poor are not appropriated to this use, their living bodies will and must be. The rich will always have it in their power to select, for the performance of an operation, the surgeon who has already signalized himself by success. But that surgeon, if he have not obtained the dexterity which ensures success by dissecting and operating on the dead, must have acquired it by making experiments on the living bodies of the poor. There is no other means by which he can possibly have gained the necessary information. Every such surgeon who rises to eminence must have risen to it through the suffering which he has inflicted, and the death which he has brought upon hundreds of the poor. The effect of the entire abolition of the practice of dissecting the dead would be to convert poor houses and public hospitals into so many schools where the surgeon, by practicing on the poor, would learn to operate on the rich with safety and dexterity. This would be the certain and inevitable result. 
and this indeed would be to treat them with real indignity and horrible injustice and proves how possible it is to show an apparent consideration for the poor and yet practically to treat them in the most injurious and cruel manner nor would the proposed plan be the means of deterring this class of people from entering the hospitals there is something reasonable in the apprehension on which this objection is founded but the answer to it is complete because it is an answer derived from experience to an objection which is merely a deduction from what is probable the plan has been acted on and found to be unattended with this result it was tried in edinburgh and the hospital was as full as it is at present it is universally acted on in france and the hospitals are always crowded the great advantages of the plan are that it would accomplish the proposed object easily and completely whereas the plan in operation effects it imperfectly and with difficulty and it would put an immediate and entire stop to all the evils of the present system at once it would put an end to the needless education of daring and desperate violators of the law it would tranquilize the public mind their dead would rest undisturbed the sepulchre would be sacred and all the horrors which the imagination connects with its violation would cease for ever we have stated that the plan has been tried experience has proved its efficacy it was adopted with perfect success in edinburgh more than a century ago in the council register for sixteen ninety four it is recorded that all unclaimed dead bodies in the charitable institutions or in the streets were given for dissection to the college of surgeons to one or two of its individual members and to the professor of anatomy this regulation at that period excited no opposition on the part of the people but effectually answered the desired object all the medical schools on the continent are supplied with subjects by public authority in a similar manner we have obtained from a friend in paris a gentleman who is at the head of the anatomical department in that city the following account of the manner in which the schools of anatomy are supplied it is stated one that the faculty of medicine at paris is authorized to take from the civil hospitals from the prisons and from the depots of mendicity the bodies which are necessary for teaching anatomy two that a gratuity of eight pence is given to the attendants in the hospitals for each body three that upon the foundation by the national convention of schools of health the statutes of their foundation declare that the subjects necessary for the schools of anatomy shall be taken from the hospitals and that since this period the council of hospitals and the prefect of police have always permitted the practice four that m brachet chief of the anatomical department of the faculty of paris sends a carriage daily to the different hospitals which brings back the necessary number of bodies that this number has sometimes amounted to two thousand per annum for the faculty only without reckoning those used in l'hôpital de la pitié but that since the general attention which has recently been bestowed upon pathologic anatomy numbers of bodies are opened in the civil and military hospitals and that the faculty seldom obtain more than a thousand or twelve hundred five that besides the dissections by the faculty of medicine and those pursued in l'hôpital de la pitié theatres of anatomy are opened in all the great hospitals for the pupils of those establishments that in these institutions anatomy is carefully taught and that students have all the facilities for dissection that can be desired six that the price of a body varies from four shillings to eight shillings and sixpence seven that after dissection the bodies are wrapped in cloths and carried to the neighboring cemetery where they are received for ten pence eight 
that the practice of exhumation is abolished that there are insurmountable obstacles to the return of that system and that bodies are never taken from burial grounds without an order for exhumation which is given only when the tribunals require it for the purpose of medical legal investigation nine that though the people have an aversion to the operations of dissection yet they never make any opposition to them provided respect be paid to the laws of decency and salubrity on account of the deep conviction that prevails of their utility ten that the relatives of the deceased seldom or never oppose the opening of any body if the physicians desire it that all the medical students in france with scarcely any exception dissect and that that physician or surgeon who is not acquainted with anatomy is universally regarded as the most ignorant of men it is time that the physicians and surgeons of england should exert themselves to change a system which has so long retarded the progress of their science and been productive of so much evil to the community we are persuaded that there is good sense enough both in the people and in the legislature to listen to their representations we would advise them to avail themselves of the means they possess to communicate information to the people and to make individual members of parliament acquainted with the subject with this view we would recommend the whole body to act in concert to appoint a committee for conducting the matter and to partition parliament as soon as they shall have made the nature of their claims and the grounds on which they rest more generally known if they act in cooperation with each other and pursue their object temperately and steadily we cannot but believe that their efforts at no distant period will be crowned with success end of part four End of the Use of the Dead to the Living by Thomas Southwood Smith.